In this episode, we'll review our mainship 390 and give our honest opinion after living on the boat for over a year. Hi, I'm Malcolm. And I'm Rachel. We are two Canadians finding exciting ways to enjoy our retirement journey. Come join us as we embrace our retirement lifestyle at home, on the road, and on the water. If you're new around here and you like what you see, please subscribe. In our last episode, we gave our top 10 tips on the Great Loop. Click the link above to see our top tips. Well, hello there. Today, we're going to talk to you and give an honest review of our main ship 390 that we used in the Great Loop. We thought that was important because 20% of all boats in the year that we went were main ships. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, huh, that's a, that's a big number of main ships out yep. there. And having spent a year on her, we think... Um, we'd like to give sort of a, a in-depth but honest opinion of the various aspects of the boat and how we thought it handled both on the loop and as a general recreational boat. And we got to know her very well. We pretty much touched every part of the boat. So I think we are in a good position to be able to give a review and the good and the bad. Yeah, so let's go. Let's go. So first of all, our boat was a 2003 Mainship 390. And so she was about 20 years old. And... We got her in Montreal. She, I think, was prepared by previous owners to do a large trip like ours. So she was quite well decked out with things, um, but had never really been on a trip this long because she really only had about 800 to 900 hours on her when we got her. And she was a main ship. Something classic. Classic. Main ship classic. I, I, to this day, I have no idea what that means. If you, <laughs> if you have any idea what a main ship classic means, put it in the comments below because we never knew. I, I think maybe she had, she came with some extra features. I think, we think maybe that's what it was. Standard yeah. in, the, in the classic version. But this vessel is, uh, like you said, a very popular boat on the loop. I think fairly reasonably priced for most people. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of other boats that are great looping boats, but maybe cost more. So this one um, is a good sort of price range for most people. And uh, so let's talk a bit about the layout. So first of all, when you get on the boat, you enter in the cockpit that's one thing that's really nice about this boat. It's really centered around the cockpit. So from the cockpit, you can either go up to the flybridge or off to the swim platform or into the salon. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty easy to get in and out of this vessel. You do have to climb over depending on the dock and where you are, uh, or you could get onto the swim platform depending on your configuration with the dinghy. But for us, the cockpit was a central part of our boat. Yeah, and those grab bars. So if you need to, just yeah. grab, hit the grab bar, pull yourself in. Yeah. So it was, it was quite easy. One of the nice things about the main ship um, vessel is that there are high railings and walk-arounds around the entire outside of the boat. So it does make the interior space a little smaller, but it is it does feel pretty safe when you're underway to walk around outside of the boat and to you know move fenders and lines around while mm -hmm. you're moving. Those uh, railings were thick. I mean, this this wasn't flimsy. You you could really lean on these things. Yeah, which I've uh, seen other boats where you know it's thin tubing or it's uh, not stainless. This was all stainless thick tubing, and it really provided you with a, a sense of safety when you're out there. Mm -hmm. It was something um, you could really grab hold of. Yeah. Some uh, of the areas, other areas of the boat, uh, if we go, say, up to the flybridge, they have nice wide benches up the top. It's really quite geared to entertaining, I would say, mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a central captain's chair. And there's an area at the back of the flybridge, lots of room at the back. And the stairs going up to the flybridge are actual stairs, not just a ladder. So mm. and lots of grab rails up there too. So it felt pretty safe actually um, going up and down also while underway. Yeah, the flybridge, mm -hmm. uh, we spent a lot of time in the flybridge. So that's pretty much 90% of the time that's where we drove from. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, it was easy to see. So that, And that's one of the big things mm -hmm. in any boat when you're doing the loop is visibility into the rivers for looking for things you can hit. Mm -hmm. And um, this, the main ship was great for that. It was comfortable up there. Um, it kept you out of the wind. We had Isinglass all the way around it. And uh, so you didn't really feel like you were in the elements uh, for most of the trip. It was, it was actually quite good. And you're right. It's very much geared to entertaining. Mm -hmm. Two bench seats on the side, one big table in the middle that would fold out. Yep. We took the mast off because we put solar on. And that gave us a tremendous amount of room on the rear of the flybridge. So you could put tables and chairs out there as well. Yep. So it was... That flybridge was one it, of the... It was a good flybridge. Yeah, yeah. it's a great feature of that main ship. We'll talk more about some of the improvements we made as we go along. But first of all, let's talk about the layout as you go inside. So when you enter from the cockpit, there's a patio door and it goes into the salon. 
which on the uh, starboard side has seating, like a couch is what it came with. We actually changed it in the end to some chairs. And on the left, on the port side is storage. And as you go forwards to port, it's the galley, which mm -hmm. is up. And I really liked having the galley up. That was a really nice feature of this particular main ship. Some of them have the, the galley down in other models, and that's probably fine too, but I preferred to have it up. Right. And then farther, just opposite the galley on the starboard side was the lower helm. So on days of inclement weather or rough seas, Malcolm would be piloting from below. And sometimes I would too, but mostly you were piloting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the instrumentation <laughs> on the lower helm was better yeah. than the upper helm. So uh, you had access to all the the mm -hmm. autopilot, the, the chart plotter that was the, the big chart plotter for mm -hmm. it. Um, so it made it easier and radar, that was all down yeah. there. Um, and when the seas got rough, uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't too much fun being in the flybridge. You're, you're a bit on a pendulum there. You're way up, you know, a good good few feet in the air. And when the boat rocks, you're rocking even more. You so, feel it a lot more. Yeah, it was yeah. much much easier to take when you were down yeah. in that lower helm. But, you know, generally speaking, we weren't operating the boat in very rough weather, but no. occasionally it did happen. So, um, you know, just to be aware of that. Yeah. So as you go forwards from this salon, you step down three or four steps and you end up in the little mini hallway. Straight ahead is the uh, master stateroom with an island queen berth. And on either side is storage. So actually we found there's quite a lot of storage yeah. in that area. So that was good. Even storage under the bed. Fairly good access on the bed itself. A couple mm -hmm. of steps on either side. And we'll talk more about that and, uh, again. On the starboard side is the head with a separate enclosed shower. That was one thing we really liked, and you fit in it. Oh, that was, that, it's a big shower. So it's one that, you know, normally in boats, um, you get in either it's a wet head, which means there's no enclosed shower. It's just all in that room. Yeah. And you, everything gets wet. Yeah. Uh, or it's like we had, which was a, a separate shower with its own door. It was big. It was great. That yeah. was, that made the difference when, uh, you know, you're out on the hook and you want to have a shower. And, Think, oh, got to have a shower. No, no, it wasn't like that at all. Yeah. It was like, yeah, this is this is actually just like being at home. The only concern is having enough water. That's enough a different water. problem. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. Yeah. But anyway, um, so we had a head, like, like a toilet with a holding tank. And then opposite the head on the other side was the guest stateroom, which had like little twin mattresses for two people to sleep there. And for most people, as was the case for us, that was basically a storage room for all of our stuff. Yeah. Um, so um, underneath the salon is the access to the engine room. Mm -hmm. There were four doors or hatches to pull up there. So we had to be able to move furniture around to access them. There was one main door floor in the floor on the port side, which was the one we opened every day to check mm -hmm. the engine. Mm -hmm. So that was most easily accessible. And the other ones were a little bit less easily accessible because we had to move furniture. Right. But apart from that, um, it was it had good access. Yeah, it did. And and, and you're right, every day we went in before we'd start or if we'd finish the day, we'd go yeah. in and check the engine. We had a camera in the engine room and that was great for underway, but it doesn't check the oil for you and it doesn't check the belts. So, um, but yeah, it, it, that was a, a relatively easy way to get into the engine. So in addition to the interior and the exterior of the boat that we just talked about, there was also a swim platform at the back. There was an issue with some... Um, water inside the swim platform for some models but ours had been already fixed at that point well i think the uh, to be clear <laughs> main ships had a recognized problem in that they filled the swim platforms full of foam and that those swim platforms are actually sort of part of the boat they're part intrinsic of the hull, to it. Right? yeah yeah and they would fill them full of foam and then water intrusion would happen and they would saturate the foam and you'd have hundreds and hundreds of pounds of water and foam weighing down the boat at the stern which is not what you want. Not at all. No. So luckily, our boat never had it. It wasn't installed with foam. A 2003 version that we had, had never had any foam in it. And so it was a completely open cavity. You could inspect it. Um, we had a bilge pump in it, and there was also a rear thruster. So it was. Uh, that's one of the things before we bought it that I checked just to make sure that, um, A, it didn't have that problem. Uh, and B, that the, uh, the, the sort of the integrity of the boat was, was all in one piece, so it was good. Yeah. All right. Some of the other features that our boat had was a diesel heater, which in Canada mm -hmm. was very important because mm -hmm. we were able to run a heater without being plugged in when at anchor. And that's something that we used a lot in the rivers and um, anywhere we were not at a marina. We could, plug, we could just mm -hmm. turn on the heater and be warm. We talked about in a previous video that, <clears throat> um, and I won't go over it, but you need clothes and not only do you need clothes but you need a source of heat 
-hmm. And you can't use an electric heater unless you're going to run your generator all the yeah. time. This diesel heater, it sipped fuel. You didn't notice it. And it kept it nice and warm. It did. Um, the other thing our boat had was an AIS receiver. Uh, we ended up adding an AIS transponder, um, which I think is definitely a requirement when you're on the loop. And we yep. can go for that a little bit more. Yep. We added solar to the top of the boat, to the top of the flybridge, which you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And along with that, a Blue Eddy, which was like uh, sort of an electric generator, if you will. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we removed the mast that comes with the boat. And we both found that the mast was not really well designed for us to walk around the boat in the flybridge. We'd constantly be hitting our heads on it. Even it would hit, I would hit my head and I'm not even that tall. Well, and it, it, it's a mast that mm -hmm. has a split on it. So a lot yeah. of people are saying, oh, that's great. You can split it. And then, which basically means mm -hmm. you can lower it and then uh, you can get under bridges. That wasn't the issue. The issue was you know, that little spreaders on it. You go around and I'd knock my head every time I go around it. It was right in the middle of the flybridge too. So it was right in the way. Yeah. So removing that was, I it was think, good work. It was, but it was a, uh, it was really worth it because yeah. it made getting around up there so yeah. much easier. The other thing we did do is we added two cameras to the boat as well. We added a rear camera that looked right over the stern, mm -hmm. and then we had another one in the engine room, and yeah. uh, they were both very useful as we yeah. as we went. We also added what's called a pep wave, and that was really to run a network on the boat yeah. and to add uh, internet, I guess, if we wanted to add SIM cards. It, it allowed us to, <laughs> we used AT&T for our connectivity is very important these days. Mm -hmm. So we used AT&T for data, um, and basically that pep wave allows you to put that SIM card in. And we, our network and the whole boat could then access that SIM card for FaceTime, yeah. calls, whatever. Yeah. Um, it worked extremely well all throughout the States. Now, you also added a floodlight at the back of the boat, which yep. was really good, especially when we did the Gulf crossing. We had that on the whole night uh, mm -hmm. when we were crossing the Gulf of Mexico. We had, you also added a speaker, so you could use that to talk to uh, people yep, if you I, needed to. Yes, I added a hailing speaker. <laughs> um, the uh, One of the VHF radios <laughs> had an option to add that hailing speaker, so I put that on. Mm -hmm. We also changed all of the lights to LED, the ones that weren't already LED. Yep. That really saves a lot of power. Including the anchor lights. Including the anchor lights, exactly. Um, we added some new fender holders, and we've had a lot of inquiries uh, to those. They were called Natty fender holders. They were very lightweight. They could fasten to our railings. And we got them at the Toronto Boat Show in very early 2020, pre-COVID. We went to get some things, and I can't source them anymore. They don't <laughs> seem to make them, and people have asked. So I would suggest, you know, having something custom made for your boat if it's something that interests you. The other thing we added that I thought was really useful was porthole rain covers. Mm, so they're plastic covers that go over the portholes so you can have your portholes open and when it's raining and not get wet. So those were really good. They were sourced in the U.S. Yeah. And we also added sort of plastic guttering around the side of the boat yep. all around to help um, with water control. Yep. And we did a lot of our own gel coat work. You were really good at that. Yeah, uh, we, had, you know, it's a twenty-year-old boat. It has some issues. There's going to be some gel coat stress cracks and <clears throat> certain things. I just mm -hmm. didn't want water getting in and yeah. then seeping into the core. So yeah. you taught myself over the three, four years just how to make sure gel coat would uh, get fixed properly, yeah. and I got better and better at it as as we went along. And helped other boaters too sometimes. On occasion, yeah, on yeah. occasion, yeah. So in terms of comfort, um, really the one of the things that some of the improvements we made were that we first changed the. I guess it was a sofa bed we had first in the yes. salon, which was really heavy. And we had to move that to get under in the engine mm -hmm. room in parts. So we decided to replace that first with a lighter weight couch. And then we found after time it wasn't as comfortable. So we ended up getting individual reclining chairs that were from an RV company. So mm -hmm. they were smaller size. And those worked out quite well. They were okay. They were easy to move. Yep. And uh, so that's something that I think would be worthwhile changing before you go. If, you know, if it's hard for you to move your furniture around and you need to. And the other thing we'd recommend is making sure that your mattress is comfortable. Yes. You're going to be wanting to get a good night's sleep whenever you can on the loop. And so if you have an older mattress, we'd suggest getting a new mattress before leaving. That's something really we, we didn't do, but we, we should, should have, have done. done. Yeah. So the, uh, <laughs> I mean, one thing you're sleeping on the boat, you're, um, and it's important you get good sleep. Yeah. Sometimes you're up early, sometimes you're up late. Yeah. Um, and that mattress, I think, makes a huge difference. Specifically to the main ship 390, though, back to that, the design of the bow of the boat creates a bulkhead right over the master stateroom bed. So you kind of have to sneak under there to get on. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you could potentially hit your head on it if you sort of sit up too fast. So that's one thing that I didn't really love about the master stateroom. No, I mean, it's... Uh, um, you, I mean, you get used to it, but it's not yeah. something that is sort of uh, recommended, I guess. You get used to it after you bunked your head a few times. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it. the newer main ships, I think, got rid of that. I, uh, but ours, ours had it. So 
In terms of the handling of the boat, the boat itself sat well in the water and maneuvered quite well in, in most cases. Yeah. In following seas, it sort of struggled a little bit with the autopilot. Um, and I think most boats do actually mm -hmm. in that case, but it doesn't sort of keep its course. It keeps sort of moving side to side all the time. It's fishtails. So you get more of an yeah. S as opposed to a straight line. If you're going into, yeah. into the seas, um, then mm -hmm. it'll hold course and in you'll go. Mm -hmm. If it's heavy beam seas, like most boats, it's going to move. So there's a, you, yeah. we tried to avoid beam seas wherever we could. Most people did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't think the main ships are really any different than most boats, unless you've got mm -hmm. a stabilized boat. The other thing we noticed with our main ship 390 is everything was equal from one side to the other side of the boat in terms of the fuel tanks and the water tanks. Mm -hmm. But the one thing they didn't do is, is equalize the batteries. So we had two house batteries that were very large, 8D, 167 ATMs pounds each. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and so they're both on the port side. So we noticed always that our boat listed to the port. And we noticed other main ships always listing to port a little bit. So uh, when we were in Perry Sound, uh, we actually took the time to move one of the batteries. We actually bought cables ahead of time, ready to do it, but we just needed the time to do it. So that's where we did it. And that was a huge effort. Um, it but it really fixed the list. We didn't have the list anymore. And keeping in mind that if you have 300 or 300 plus pounds on one side of the boat, it makes all the tanks, like those ones yeah. we talked about, the water tank, the diesel tank, because they're all connected, it makes them all drain over there as well. So even though you may think it's 300 pounds by itself, in the end it isn't. It's actually 300 pounds plus all of the excess that's actually going over to those other tanks. Yeah, so when your tanks are like half full, for example, or even three quarters full, more of it is on the port side, that's even right. though um, you know you think they'd be equal, but they, they yeah. always were supposed to be equal. Yeah. And the other thing about the main ship 390, and it might be true with most boats, is it doesn't back up very well in terms of knowing which way. I remember we went out in our boat in the middle of the water in the Thousand Islands where we had our boat. First got it. Yeah. And we, you know, you're trying to back up into a slip. So you're like, why, what's going on with my boat? So we tried turning the wheel all the way one way and backing up. And then we turned the wheel all the other way and backed up. And guess what? It went the same way both times. <laughs> so that's called prop walk. And yeah. basically all props, if it's a single, certainly <laughs> rotate obviously one way. I mean, yeah. when you're going forward, when you're going backwards. So it will drag the boat in one particular mm -hmm. direction, no matter how you turn the rudder. Yeah. Those rudders are tiny. So you've got to get water going over the right. rudder before it actually affects the change. That's one thing actually about the main ship that we noticed compared to some other vessels is the rudder is very small for the mm. size of the boat. It would mm -hmm. be better to have a bigger rudder. Yeah, we met one gentleman that actually put a big rudder on and it, it really made a big difference. Yeah, that was an it, articulated rudder. It was. Yeah. The difference uh, for us, which we haven't mentioned, is the main ship also has thrusters. Ours does. So it has a bow thruster and a stern thruster. Um, so my personal preference is really for the stern thruster. <laughs> Uh, when you're backing up, that stern thruster makes a huge difference. It can move the boat. When you're mm -hmm. trying to get into a slip, when you're just moving in tight quarters, I would use the stern thruster before I'd use the bow thruster. Yep. And and it worked a treat. That yeah. thing um, it was the first thruster I'd go to. And because we were a single engine, you know, you could do it without thrusters. And yep. everyone said, oh, it's cheating. You've got yeah. it. So yeah. we used it. Yeah. So uh, in terms of maintenance... The main ship 390 is fairly good that way. It has the systems are pretty simple mm -hmm. um, with a single engine, a diesel engine. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very complicated to maintain for a regular no. basis. So you've got, you know, your fuel filters you have to change regularly and you've got your oil and your oil filters. And that's pretty much the main. Yeah, I mean, engine. and they're all accessible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, you know, we had a Raycor 9000. So those are really easy to change. Um, yeah. I added a vacuum gauge on the top of it so I could actually see when um, it was time to change it, mm -hmm. um, even though we had regular schedules. We had a, a, a primary and secondary filter for fuel. We had a one main oil filter. And we also had, a re I think it's called a reverso extracto or something, um, oil pump. And that would pump the oil out of the engine and the generator. And it would also put the oil back in. That was the easiest thing to do in oil change. I could do a whole oil change in about 10 minutes for yeah, both. Just need a big five gallon bucket. Yep. Put it in. So mm -hmm. that was, I mean, it, it, when it came time for oil changes, it, you don't get messy. You just put the hose in, turn it on, and off you go. So there was a lot of things that were very, very simple about this boat that made it uh, very easy for us to maintain. Yeah. Uh, one of the criticisms we have of this boat is the design of the rain drainage system from the flybridge oh, and the yes. cockpit. 
we discovered um, that, first of all, it wasn't very easy to access it through the cockpit. We had to add an access hatch just to even get in there. I was climbing over, because I'm smaller, climbing over the water tanks to try to get into the back corners. And one of them I could get to, and the other one I couldn't. It was just too far in. And uh, we certainly read on forums online where people went in and they had to be hauled out by their feet because mm-hmm. they got stuck in there. And that's not something we were willing to do. It's- but the, the way that the drainage system works is the pipe would come down into the in under the cockpit and then have a loop and come up and drain out the side of the boat. And because of that loop there, you can't drain, you can't sort of um, empty it properly, especially if your boat is stored outside in the winter. Um, in the winter. So when the water freezes, it cracks. And then all the water that drains from the flybridge and the cockpit goes down into your bilge. So we discovered that the hard way and we ended up fixing it. And I think we fixed it on that boat, but I, I don't know. I was, was pretty suspicious all the time. <laughs> so the, the, I, and it's difficult to explain here. Those with 390s, I mean, maybe, maybe you'll be able to uh, associate with this. The I'll, I'll give it an attempt. So basically that water would come down from the flybridge and from the cockpit and join up into a common pipe. That pipe would then run out to a box, fiberglass box, that was bonded to the inside of the hull. And then there was a little hole in the exterior of the hull that all that water was supposed to drain mm-hmm, out. Mm-hmm. And that's how it's supposed to work. That box was is inboard, but it was exposed through that hole. Mm-hmm. And this is pretty much at the water line. I'm going to say maybe three inches above the water line. So it was, you know, it was close. Yeah. So what we found was because our, our boat by previous owners had been stored outside and there was obviously, obviously some water in there, which I think is hard to avoid, that box had started to pull away from the hull. Because of ice. Because of ice. Yeah. So that became one of the reasons, one of the first indications that we had a problem was, this is before we went on the loop, was we'd see water in the... In the bilge. In the bilge, yep. in the stern. And it was like, well, where's that water coming from? And little did we know, we're washing the boat down, and it's going down in the in the scupper, and we're like, why is the bilge going off? So there was two issues there. <laughs> yeah. One, the pipe had actually fallen off, so yeah. when we were washing the water, it was yeah. just going directly in the bilge. Yeah. Once we figured that one out, then we were still getting water, not as much, but still getting water in the bilge, going, why are we getting water? Then we realized, mm-hmm. oh, it's this box and the hoses and the through hulls yeah. that are associated with it. We remedied all those things. And happy to say that it's a dry bilge as far as uh, the boat is now. But it took a long while to figure all that out as we went through. And it's just a caution for other 390 owners that do store your boat in colder weathers to ensure, A, you either blow all those hoses out or you inspect it. And it took us a long time to diagnose it, to know exactly what was going on. And, you know, this boat was built in St. Augustine, Florida, so they don't have to deal with this issue down there. So mm-hmm. they didn't even think about this in no. a northern climate. So it's something no. that only Canadians think have to deal with, or people at least in the northern part of, of yeah. the continent. Um, so that was one thing. We had to add an access hatch. Accessibility under the cockpit was not great in the back corners. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's something that uh, I would criticize a little bit, mainship. Accessibility <laughs> to the generator? Not good. So, um, you know, you can, you can do the work to change the fan belt, which I did, the two belts. It's not, but you to can, fit in there. You, you do the work to change the impeller, which I did. You can get in there just to check the oil levels. But, boy, it's difficult. Certainly some of my size, it's difficult to get in there mm-hmm. and actually do that regular maintenance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, solar helped us because it, mean, I mean, it didn't have to run it all that much. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's one mm-hmm. other area that you want to be careful of if you're going to uh, – do maintenance on the generator. It's very hard to get to. And the very last thing that I think caused us a lot of grief um, was the exhaust elbow mm-hmm. um, in under the engine. Like this was under the um, the starboard side, mm-hmm. and it's a fiberglass component that goes from I think five, it's five inches? inches to six inches. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a custom part, and it's made out of fiberglass. And we think that it failed because it had a problem right from day one. So the fiberglass had a little small crack in it, which over time wore, and then we had some seepage of water there. And we noticed it only when we really got to salt water, because then you Mm -hmm. have some of that crusting, that white sort of crystallizing that happens with salt. And it's a part of the uh, engine that has a lot of pressure and a lot of heat. So it's it really became noticeable, um, you know, when we entered, after we entered Mobile. Very annoying. So... Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get to, you don't, one thing you don't want in your engine room is salt water. 
Like and you, and you, you don't want it spraying and missing either. You don't want it. So uh, it took several uh, attempts to diagnose it, which eventually we did. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's a 90 degree elbow. So it's one of those, it's the only one on the boat that's 90 degrees. Um, and uh, we were able to rem remediate the problem. I think we did a tremendous, the fix was great. And it, it uh, never leaked again, which is perfect. That's what you want. But it was just one of those things that was just nagging. Every time you go down there, you'd be looking, oh, is it leaking? Is it leaking? Yeah. Luckily, as I said, it was it was mitigated. And uh, I'm sure it's got many years of future use. But it was, it was, I'm sure, a fault at the time of manufacture. It was just one of those parts they had to, you know, source from somewhere else. And, mm -hmm. and over years, it just failed. So it was, uh, it was due, I guess. We were the ones to fix it. And, and so we did. The only other thing I'd say we, we should add is we added a dinghy and an outboard to the yes. boat as well. We got a high field 310, I believe. That's what it was, yeah. With a Tahatsu 20. 20 horsepower, yeah. Um, we got a bigger dinghy and a bigger motor because we knew that was going to be our car. And if you're in the Bahamas or if you're in Florida in some places, getting there quickly and being able to carry enough stuff is important. You know, it'd be great to have one of those electric motors that you can recharge on your boat, but they go maybe three knots, mm -hmm. um, maybe four. Mm -hmm. This little dinghy would go 17 to 18 knots. And, and it was like our safety vehicle, too. Was. So if we were doing a crossing, we made sure that we could cut the lines to the dinghy. It was ready to throw everything in and if yeah. you had to abandon ship and get in the dinghy and go somewhere. Yeah. So it, it it was a Hypalon dinghy. It was really good. Um, mm -hmm. We loved that thing. Yep. We used and it a lot. It was a great addition to a boat. And, yeah. I, and if you are anchoring out, if that's something you want to do as part of your loop, uh, I would certainly research dinghies and what you think would work best for you. Yeah. Um, certainly people with dogs. We don't have dogs, but a lot of people on the loop do. They have to go to shore um, with their dogs. They love their dinghies. Uh, yeah. Or maybe it's a love-hate. I don't know. But the dogs <laughs> jump in and off they go to shore once a day yeah. or twice a day. But the but. high field dinghy is a very good quality dinghy, and we took the time to research them. Yeah. I think we got it at the Toronto Boat Show, we did. and um, it was worth it for sure. It yeah. was a very good dinghy. It was a, a rib, so it was an aluminum bottom. It was, yeah. it was durable. That thing, yeah. that thing really was uh, worth its, mm -hmm. with its price. So overall, that's our impression of the main ship 390. I think overall, it's a very good, I don't know if you give it a rating of stars out of 10 or something, <laughs> um, but you know, some of the issues you may not have on your main ship or on your vessel, but these are the issues we faced and the challenges that we had. And we enjoyed a lot of the good things about the main ship 392. So definitely a good vessel for the loop. You know, sometimes you discover these issues with your boat as you're going and you just have to deal with it at That's the time, right. which is kind of what we had to do. Every boat's gonna have its issues. <laughs> yep. I would recommend the main ship 390 for those that are looking to do the loop and, and they're looking for a comfortable boat. Mm -hmm. If there's two of them, if there's more than two people, I, maybe I'd think a little bit about it. But certainly for us, it worked very well. It worked well on the Great Lakes. It worked well through the rivers. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't go, you know, super long distances in open ocean. But you plan it, carefully. You for do those. plan carefully <laughs> for those. And I think if you're looking to do the loop and you can find yourself a good 390, there's, you know, like any boat, there's bad 390s and good ones. You got to get the survey done. You got to look at it with uh, those critical eyes. If you get yourself a good boat, it will take you through that Great Loop and and you won't test the boat in doing so. It's it's just one of those boats that it lives up to its name and it lives up to the fact that you've got 20% of people who are doing the loop are mm -hmm. actually in main ships. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, no, I think it's uh, definitely a recommended from us. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed this video. Leave some comments below. If you have a main ship 390 or any other vessel and you have questions. Love to hear it. Leave a question below. We'd love to hear from you.